There, there wasn't really a, a single defining moment. Uh, I was brought up in rural Scotland and uh, we didn't really have a very broad horizon. Uh, I used to ask my mother what she thought. So in my, in my family, my father was rather uncommunicative and worked. My mother was the one that probably was the more intelligent of the two. And I would ask her what she thought I should do when I grew up. And she said, oh, she didn't really know, but uh, uh, my grandfather had been an engineer. And so she thought maybe engineering was, was a thing. But I, I never followed that up, actually. I just followed the, um, the educational system in the UK, which had been uh, brought into the modern era in 1944 by the Butler Education Act, which brought in universal secondary education for people even from poor backgrounds. <coughs> so I just followed uh, the system, followed my nose through primary, secondary school, uh, found out about universities, then university, and then found out about PhDs, postgraduate work, and then carried on in science. And then uh, in academic work, um, I did find science and maths much more interesting and tried to uh, extricate myself from uh, studying literature or foreign languages as early as possible. And when we were asked in high school, aged about 13, to make choices. In, in the UK, you specialise rather earlier than in many other countries. So I chose um, maths and science and got rid of French, Latin, English and so on. Then I was called to see the headmaster who said, you know, you cannot go to university unless you have a language in your academic qualification. So then I reinstituted the language I was least bad at, which was French. Uh, and then after five years of being taught French, managed to fail the exam. And so in my sixth year in high school, I was the only person left in the class. The teacher and I, for a whole year, and of course by then I learnt and managed to scrape a C grade in French, then I was allowed to go to university. So then um, I was uh, able to pursue the thing that I had decided was most interesting and most uh, valuable to pursue, which was the science career. Well, the teaching in Scotland and the value of education is highly thought of. Um, in fact, I, having been born in Edinburgh, uh, but in the maternity hospital, because there wasn't one in, in the rural, in the borders. Um, after about two weeks, uh, my parents were living in Tweedmouth, which is actually south of the River Tweed, Tweedmouth, in Northumberland, in England. So I went for two years to an English primary school, and then we moved probably about 50 miles west to be two miles north of the border in a little village called Newcastleton, and then I found, having moved from uh, 200 metres south of the border to two miles north of the border, I found I was one year behind in my education because the Scottish education system is more advanced than the English one. So I had to spend a, a year scrambling to catch up. Um, and, uh, and then the teaching uh, in primary school and then in secondary school in Hoyk High School uh, was... Each time I moved schools, the teaching became slightly better. And so I think I had a, a reasonably good state-funded educational system. And this Education Act that was brought in in 1944 was meant to encourage people from, let's say, not wealthy backgrounds to continue in higher education to, so for the good of the country. So I found when I was um, 15, which was the school leaving age, and many of my friends just left school to get a job, to work, to help themselves and the family. Um, my parents were given a grant from the government, 50 pounds, it was a bribe really, to, although my parents were quite supportive, they wanted me to carry on anyway, but we got a 50 pound grant, that would be worth probably one or 2,000 pounds a year now, which came to the parents to uh, compensate them potentially for having lost income that would have come from their, their child taking a working job. And then I just carried on through the educational system 
through uh, undergraduate and then graduate degrees. So I think our education was not outstanding because later on I met people who had been to much better schools and they were better educated, but it was certainly good enough. And, and I felt each step I took, I was making a step forward in, in uh, the quality of the education. Now it's, it's not like, uh, you know, in the early uh, 20th century, a lot of the physicists said they would go up into mountains and then the truth was revealed as they would. That was, no, I was brought up in the countryside and there were really no particular activities. We just to go wandering, just to explore. And as we got older, we would explore further and further. So one mile, five miles, 10 miles and so on, just in the borders. But uh, when I went for one year to Edinburgh prior to university, we had a group of friends in a school in Edinburgh called Borough Muir. And we noticed that one of our classmates had a car. He used to drive to school in a car. One person in the whole school had a car. So we, uh, three, of, three or four of us, befriended this person and persuaded him we should go camping in Scotland when we were about 16, I think. I, 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 I was not allowed to drive, but this slightly older. So we went off camping for a week in March or February in, in the, uh, you know, the Shehalyan, uh, Loch Tummel, Loch Rannoch, all the rural parts of Scotland, which is very beautiful. And so um, a group of us, maybe four or five, uh, originally high school students, but eventually university, that was one of our activities, basically exploring the countryside around and eventually going maybe 100 miles from from Edinburgh to into the highlands of Scotland. And I think that none of us, I think, left Scotland until we were about 20. So, you know, we were Scottish and then eventually we would go to England and then we went on a trip to Spain and so on. Um, and so that was probably from aged 16 to 20, we would go hiking. And then we were off, I was in Cambridge and then in America and so on. And then much later on, so uh, when uh, these same friends that we used to go hill walking uh, in our teens began to retire, uh, one of them, um, who became a physics teacher in Scotland in our growth, Andrew White, he said, I think we should start uh, going up the hills again. And they have this um, system in Scotland uh, invented by uh, the Reverend Munro where he made a list of all the hills. They're not very big, actually. The highest uh, hill in Scotland is about, uh, about one point, one and a half kilometers, so 4,400 feet. Um, but Munro made a list, and there are nearly 300, and they're called Munros. And so this friend, Andrew, decided that he was going to do what is called Munro bagging which means you, you spend your entire life going up these hills and you tick them off. And then eventually when you reach the 292nd, the, you know, the last one, you have a party with all your friends on the top of this. Anyway, this friend decided to do that. He never finished actually. And I said, well, I'm not, I will join him on interesting hills, but I wasn't going to go up all the boring hills. And we've done you know, probably 20 or 30. So every year we go for about 10 or 11 years now, from aged, let's say, 61 to 72. And uh, those of us who used to go in our teens now have grandchildren. So the grandchildren uh, come up, they, they were 11 and now they're 22 or something like that. So last summer, um, my wife Jade came and we had a whole gang. We went up one or two of these hills in Scotland with the same friends from my school age uh, time. So it's a hobby but it's, it's spread to uh, the family and the children and the grandchildren. I, I think um, various people in the lab where I work, the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, uh, particularly the uh, graduate students, the PhD students, they are very sensitive to the, uh, the influence and the importance of Nobel Prize. So a number of the students had been saying for about five or six years, do you think that because of the success of this electron cryo microscopy method that I had been a sort of advocate of how um, 
powerful it was going to be one day. And then eventually it did turn out to work quite well. The student said, do you think you're going to be? And I said, well, you know, you can't predict these things. But, you know, many years had gone by. So I, I don't think any of the uh, this year's um, chemistry Nobel Prize winners were unusually surprised. It didn't come out of the blue, uh, which it, I think it's done in other areas for yeah. literature. There's so many writers, that's very difficult to predict. Um, anyway, so I was just going about, as I've done you know, every year, my normal business. And this year, on the 4th of October, which is when the Chemistry Nobel Prize was announced, um, a number of us, about 70 or 100, were at a meeting near Cambridge, about an hour and a half from Cambridge, in Leicester. Uh, and Leicester has uh, a number of the faculty professors there who uh, used to be students in the MRC lab in Cambridge, and they had decided to um, venture forth and broaden their structural biology research activities to include electron cryomicroscopy. They bought microscopes and they were having a meeting to announce this to the local people in Leicester. It was a, an inauguration meeting, a two-day symposium, and uh, the manager of their facility in Leicester came from Japan, so he had invited about 20, so it was a sort of Leicester University Japanese meeting at which there were other speakers, and there were from our lab, there were three or four people. So I was sitting in the audience at 10.15 on the second day. I had spoken on the first day. Um, in a meeting all to do with cryo-EM. And one of the speaker was John Briggs, another group leader at uh, MRC in Cambridge. And sitting beside me was uh, a second group leader, also from the LMB, Mandat Lammers. And the phone, the, the phone rang, a mobile phone in my pocket. And because I'm in a meeting, I'm surrounded by 70 people, I'm in the middle of the row, there's no easy way out. I pressed reject the button. And then I thought I'd better look and see what it was. It said it was from, from Sweden. And uh, we, we don't often get phone calls from Sweden. So when it immediately rang again, about 30 seconds later, I thought, well, maybe I ought to, you know, I, I ought to answer this. So um, I, I stood up and excused my way. And people said they thought it was a bit rude that I should be leaving from the middle of a lecture room to take a phone call. And so I went outside and it was actually Gunnar von Heinji, um, who I knew quite well, and he'd been in Cambridge and so on. He was saying, you know, we have something important to tell you, and it turned out it was the Nobel Chemistry Committee. And then meanwhile, back in the lecture room, uh, one of the other people, um, Radostin Danef, who came from Munich, he was going to give a talk later, he must have been more aware about the timing and the chemistry Nobel Prize. So when I got up to leave, he thought he would have a look at his mobile phone. So while I was out, they put the press conference up on the screen. So when I went back in, they all knew, knew about this. So then I thought, um, it's the coffee break. Uh, I, I could, you know, listen to what everybody had to say and then, and then go back in and continue almost as if nothing had happened. Uh, and I tried to do that, but uh, email, emails started to arrive. You know, some of them before the actual press announcement from people in Sweden who knew. One minute before, you know, Bank Norden from Gothenburg sent an email and so on. So then it was 100, 200, 300. After about 400 emails, I thought this is, this is out of control. So I thought perhaps it would be best to uh, extricate myself from the meeting. And then I drove back to Cambridge where they had already arranged a party, which they were going to have whether I was there or not. Um, and joined in, the, you know, there's there a little press conference. And then uh, we had some uh, sparkling wine. Only six bottles of champagne and about 60 bottles of Prosecco. I think, were, e e you know, the economy isn't in terribly healthy at the moment. So, yeah. I think uh, one of the things I've come to realize is that uh, the Nobel Foundation and the, the, uh, the award committees of course, they have their own internal importance, and it's, uh, it's very valuable for the people who receive the awards and for the science, but uh, a greater impact is that the publicity and the outreach that the Nobel Foundation does has a very uh, big impact and value in the world. So um, people, particularly in countries like India and so on, they pay a lot of attention to it. 
So I think one of the major roles of the Nobel uh, Foundation is to lead in the dissemination of the information and the importance of science. And I think it does that better than any other organization in the whole world, actually. So it, it is, um, it's beyond the recognition of individual contributions. I think it's a, it's a global role that reaches into all parts of the world. And that's something that I, I've, I appreciate greatly and admire. Because electron cry, microscopic cry, M as we call it, has become so powerful and so productive, many places all over the world have, over the last few years, been uh, investing in the equipment and buying it. The company that manufactures the equipment cannot keep up. They were making three a year in 2012. They're now doing 50 a year. And, they, 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 and, and there is an insatiable demand at the moment. We are, we, estimated that the world needs about three or four hundred of these and they've only delivered about 90 so far. So it's in a growth phase and the, the problem now is there aren't enough people who are experts in the methodology and so uh, everybody involved are getting offers w at higher salaries than before. So it's really quite a... Uh, and so this meeting in Leicester was one of many meetings that have been held in the last year as each university which previously had no cry we am facility they are they are now launching it and they want the, all the local people as well as people nearby to know about it so they all do this by having a little uh, one or two day symposium and so Leicester was one of probably 20 or 30 that I've not I haven't been to, I've been to a few um, but there are too many now actually so so it is a, a very successful method that's proving to be very popular and and actually we think uh, that there's still quite a long way to go in terms of technical improvements. So this, uh, at this moment, it's still, you know, if, if young people ask, I think we can certainly uh, recommend this as a productive uh, direction to go in in terms of their research. I think at the moment, uh, electron cry microscopy is producing a lot of very valuable information about how biology works, about how the proteins and the receptors in biology work. But I don't think there has been yet a direct uh, uh, impact on the benefit to mankind from uh, electron cry microscopy specifically, but uh, we believe that this is one of a number of methods that are the basis of structural biology as a field. So rather, th rather than saying <coughs> excuse me, that we are cry we am experts and there is a separate group of nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy structural biologists and x-ray crystallographers. We've rather thought that uh, the whole uh, area, the whole enterprise, would be best named structural biology. And actually, Don Casper, earlier this year, he was 90, he explained that he thought the term structural biology to describe what structural biologists do started around about 1960 when they had a department in Boston, uh, the Children's Cancer Hospital, where they had Department of Structural Biology on the door. And, but now there are lots of structural biology departments and Casper felt that structural biology started properly per se as a discipline probably back in the 20s, 1927, um, when um, J.D. Bernal and w William Asbury were two people in the Cavendish lab, the physics department in Cambridge, who were diverging into working on muscle and biological structures. So we, we think the field should be structural biology, and so you can then look, since X-ray crystallography seems to be about 30 years more uh, advanced in terms of time scale than the cry -M, you can look at what has the structural biology method through the tool of X-ray crystallography, what has that done for mankind? Until about uh, 1980 or so, uh, people said, well, it hasn't done any useful. But what, first one, and then two, and now about 30 pharmaceutical drug companies got into structural biology through X-ray crystallography around about, let's say, uh, Glaxo in 1982, they closed it, but then many companies about 1990. So now, uh, virtually every new drug has a structure of that drug bound to the receptor, an enzyme and uh, uh, a biological structure that this molecule has been designed either to inhibit or to activate. And these are the two um, 
ways you might try to influence a particular biological pathway. For example, a virus like HIV uh, uh, producing AIDS has, an, has uh, six or eight genes in its, its genome. One of them is a, a protease that cleaves the proteins that make HIV work. And if you block that protease with a, uh, an enzyme inhibitor, these are the anti-HIV uh, drugs that have stopped people from dying, those drugs were developed by finding out through X-ray crystallography what the structure of that drug bound, and then you make the drug better. And now there are dozens of drugs now uh, made by this method. In fact, about 10 years ago, uh, Chris Tate and I uh, had been working in the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge on another family called the G-protein coupled receptors. We started a little company. They have done the structure now of 20 or 30 of these um, drug targets and have, de have developed a number of inhibitors or activators for particular drugs, depending on what you want to do. If you want to stop your heart going faster, you have a beta blocker. If you want to open up your um, air channels, you have a beta-2 agonist that opens them up. So each of these drugs uh, can be improved and tailored to be um, more perfect through structural biology. And so we think that in the future, electron cry microscopy will be able to contribute to structures of molecules that, are, let's say, are intractable to other methods like X-ray crystallography and give you uh, uh, a structure-based drug design um, to improve the drugs. Uh, and, and then the drugs themselves will help you to uh, inhibit or activate a particular activity, say, antiviral or uh, stimulating the immune response. So we're pretty confident that it will help. It hasn't helped so far. When the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology was uh, first opened in 1962, that was four years before I went there to be a, a graduate student, um, the lab was a merger of a number of groups from elsewhere in Cambridge and London, particularly Max Perutz and John Kendrew, uh, Francis Crick, came from the physics department in the Cavendish where they had many separate tea rooms. They had one for the technicians, one for the workshop, one for the scientists, one for the students and so on. And they thought this was uh, uh, bad for communication. So Max Perutz particularly thought there should be one canteen, everybody could come. And his wife Gisela, both of them came from Austria, she managed the canteen for about 15 years. Uh, and it was, you know, it had about oh, six or eight tables, six chairs at each table, everyone was mixed up. And the idea, so largely Perutz's idea actually, although I think Francis Crick was also very keen on discussing uh, ideas as much as possible. And the idea is that if you can spend a few hours or even a day talking about something in the canteen, having tea, having lunch, having coffee, and if that uh, results in you deciding not to do an experiment, you've spent um, a few hours uh, discussing something in great detail and saved yourself months or years of time you would have wasted because you did the wrong experiment. And so this has now uh, continued as a tradition and now we have a new lab actually that's it's on its third canteen. There was a little one at the beginning with maybe seats for about 30 or 35 people, a bigger one with about 100. Now we have one that holds about 200 in a new building that was opened about five years ago. Still one canteen, everybody can go to, it's open. You can see who you would like to s speak to, sit beside, who you might be wishing to on a particular occasion to avoid. But in general, you could easily spend... Um, a large part of the day in the canteen, polishing up or thinking of new ideas as well. Sometimes you'll be sitting there. So one example recently, uh, two of us were sitting talking to some visitors from the company that manufactures the electron microscopes that we use in cryo-EM. And now at the other side of the canteen, there was another LM group, group talking to visitors from a pharmaceutical company. And as they were passing uh, the the CEO of Aztecs, the pharmaceutical company, said, you know, we've heard about this cryo-EM. We are thinking that perhaps some pharmaceutical companies should buy their own microscope. And so we said, oh, well, we happen to have the people who manufacture them here. So they sat down and within six months, uh, this chance meeting in the canteen, two different groups, they were meeting. They had decided that five pharmaceutical companies in Cambridge 
would finance the purchase of one of these new state-of-the-art five million pound microscopes, which is now housed in the nanoscience department in Cambridge, fully funded by five pharmaceutical companies that use, each of them have a day a week, and then the weekend is given to the university or to the MRC to use. And so that's quite a good example. And it's been very successful. They've been running for about 18 months. They now decided to buy a second microscope, another five million pounds. That will be nearby the first one. And that, that's, um, and, and so every day there are ideas like this. Uh, you know, uh, people are discussing something, they think of a new idea, and they decide that's a much better thing to do than what they were doing before. And then a couple of times in my career, which is 50 years now, a couple of times we've been at a particularly difficult stage, and we've gone out for coffee in the morning, and we decided it would be better just to, we stayed for the entire day. So we just, and then lunch, we would say, okay, it was lunchtime, and then tea time, and so on. And at 5.30, it turns out, the people who were involved in that discussion gave up completely the useless experiments that they'd been doing as a result of the discussion and decided on a new direction. So I think it's still very valuable. And so it, it's, it's actually an efficiency saver, a creator of new ideas, or a debunker of really bad old ideas. In terms of giving advice to young people, I think... The most important thing, and you know, I've watched a number of young people uh, developing their ideas, um, I think it, it is important not to be fixated on whatever you think is the most important idea initially, but to be very flexible. But probably most of all, the key thing is to do something that you really uh, you enjoy, which usually means you're quite good at it. Do something that you yourself are intrinsically motivated to do, even if it turns out that's not terribly well paid. And the general idea is if you do something well and pursue it and uh, deliver uh, the vision that came from uh, wanting to do something you do, someday someone will pay you really well for doing exactly what you want to do. So that's like having um, a paid hobby. So I think uh, in terms of scientific research, most of the people that we know aren't really doing it. A few will be saying at the beginning of their career, should I be um, a writer or a politician? There are some very talented people. They could do anything they wanted. Um, and they will always have a difficulty to know, and should they go into uh, to industry or into academia? Um, but I, I, my view is that the, the, thing, the best of people do the thing that internally motivates them. Then if they have some disappointments, um, they don't mind because they're even though they're, dis but they're still doing the thing that they like to do well. So I think the, that would be my view is that people should be encouraged to do something. Um, you shouldn't try to persuade them or they shouldn't try to persuade themselves to do something that uh, might have a very valid reason for doing it, but that they feel is a burden or an effort. They should do something that they really enjoy doing and, and want to do internally themselves. And then one day, uh, they'll be able to satisfy that. Ah, I am not a professor, I am doctor. Yeah. And I had tried to avoid throughout my life becoming a professor. Really? Because professor means that you profess to understand something. So we're back backroom away. scientists rather than front of the... Uh, house professors. No problem. <laughs> <laughs>